This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. I tell you, God's up to something. You know, a couple of things I did not even share with Mary this morning about stirring up old anointings. This morning as I was in prayer, something familiar began to happen. And God reminded me years and years ago when I was back at the Specker Barracks Complex when I was in the military, the uh, chapel was actually built around a center garden that was open air. And so you could go out there, and I would go out there, and I would pray for an hour or so before services. And just the anointing that would fall, and the excitement that would fall, I could literally sense angels meeting there with me. And that's beginning to happen again. And the old fire that I used to have is starting to come back. In fact, I already know what the new place is going to look like when it's done because God showed me while we were doing praise and worship. I closed my eyes and I was there standing on the platform. I know what it's going to look like. Now I just got to make sure I build it in the pattern that God showed me. But I, there's, there's an excitement on the inside of me. I can't wait till we get that new place where we can just open the doors and say, y'all come in, but just, just a warning when you do. If you have a devil, it's going to get cast out. If you have a bondage, it's going to be broken. If you have nonsense, we're going to leave that at the door. 2020, God told me this morning, is the year of kingdom expectation. And so I want to deal with the kingdom and messianic expectation this morning. And I want to give a little bit of New Testament background. Because we can say, well, you just don't know how bad it is. Haven't you heard what the Luciferian elite are going to do? Let me tell you something. The Luciferian elite have always been about to do something. Haven't you realized that? And I know they got lots of plans. But you see, I serve this king. I believe right now there's a meeting going on in heaven. And they're looking for someone in heaven and earth and under the earth who could be found worthy to open that scroll. And I think at this very moment that the Apostle John in this hour, in this day, he's sitting there weeping because there was no one found. And at this moment there's an angel coming up to him and saying, be of good comfort because the Lamb has overcome, and he is worthy to open the scroll. You see, God has a plan. They got their plans. They got their plans within plans, within plans, within plans. God doesn't need that. God just has a plan. Because when you're sovereign, you fill all time and space, his plan is going to happen. And guys, you know, we, we, we see in the last decade, and I'm not saying we're not at the end of days, I'm looking for the Lord to come back between 2030, 2035. There's a lot of reasons for that I don't want to get into this morning. And I could be wrong. If he comes sooner than that, he can punch my ticket. I'm out of here, okay? I'm not going to sit down and try to strap myself to the ground and say, no, I said 2030 to 35. If he wants to come tomorrow, I'm out of here, okay? 
But I don't think we got the job done yet. There's a whole harvest. There's a whole generation that has not heard the gospel of the kingdom. They've heard some watered down, milky toast. I mean, the, the milk has been watered down so much it looks more like water than it does milk even. I mean, it, it's, it's so beyond skim milk. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to get milk, I like that whole milk. And if I'm going to have coffee, I want that half and half. I want lots of cream in it. Glory to God. And I want, if I'm going to get the milk of the word, I want lots of cream in it. I want half and half. I want the half that prophetic to where it will make your toes curl while I'm getting the word. They haven't seen the power of God. The church has not demonstrated the power of God. And there are several reasons for this. Now, I want to set this because there are patterns within history. There are patterns within the word of God. Now, during the second temple period... There were a host of writings that fueled messing and expectation of the people in Jesus' day. These writings include First Enoch, Jubilees, Jasher, and there were others. It was at a fever pitch. In fact, there were a lot of guys, we find out from Gamaliel when we read in the book of Acts, there were a lot of guys that claimed to be Messiah, and that whole thing just petered out. It did, you know, when I, was, I used to have a sergeant major when I was at a field artillery unit, that he said the, zero, the, the maximum effective range of an excuse is zero meters. That was about the way those messianic people did back then. They claimed to be a messiah and they weren't. It would hardly get out the end of the cannon for it and fall to the ground. How many know Jesus said in that way? He started something 2,000 years ago and it's still going. And Gamaliel warned them that if this thing continues, it's of God. Okay, But they were at this fevered pitch while they were under harsh Roman rule. Okay, The expectations of the people were an all-time high, but what were the religious leaders? Their fears were at an all-time high. Why? They were afraid of losing their power and sought to circumvent Messiah. His plans, the rising of Messiah... And they sought, for their own selfish ends, the destruction of Messiah when he came. Say, brother, what has that got to do with the day? We have a lot of religious leaders that won't teach on end-time prophecy anymore. It's just a big warm fuzzy, the best life now. A big warm fuzzy, whatever the people want, we will compromise anything to keep the people coming in the doors because they have so left the gospel, the remnant won't go there anymore. And so they're fighting for membership. Let's see how many sinners that we can come in and make them feel at home. And they never have to change. We'll change our theology to make them feel comfortable. It's the same pattern, isn't it? And as we approach the end of days, there should be expectations of Messiah to manifest. How many know we're on the edge of the greatest revival that human history has ever seen? Did you know with the number of people on the earth that in 10 years, 10 years, we could win more people to Jesus than have been won since the day of Pentecost until yesterday? How's that for a harvest? You see, when Jesus prophesied about the harvest, he said, I'm going to get a harvest. I'm going to bind up the tares and separate them first. Then I'm going to go get my wheat. And I want his barns to be full. I've got to have this expectation. <coughs> the miracles that we see throughout the Gospels and Acts are because of the expectation of the people. Expectation brings the kingdom. If you didn't write that down, you need to. Expectation brings the kingdom. But I'm already going to deviate from my notes. What are you feeding on? What are you feeding on? What's your expectation? My expectation, things are going to get worse and darker and darker and darker and darker. Well, you know, you get what you believe for. I could be over here having a Holy Ghost party, healed from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, and you're set there in such darkness, you isn't going to get anything. Because you get what you expect. Where's our expectation this morning? I heard Bill Hammond last night, we were listening. He was speaking as a prophet, dealing with things that are coming in 2020. Here's a guy, 86 years old. 
And he's saying, he said, listen, when Moses went out, his eye was not dim. He wasn't having to fuss with art all the time, arthritis. Art was not his constant companion. Joshua was. And so here's an 86-year-old say, by the end of 2020, uh, these hip problems, they're going to go. These knee problems, they're going to go because I've got them targeted now and I'm going to pray and combat them every day until they're gone because I still got work to do. Well, let me tell you something. If an 86-year-old still has work to do, this soon-to-turn 60-year-old has got a lot of work to do. You've got a lot of work to do. You say, well, Mike, I can't do what you do. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to do what you're supposed to do and be faithful at it. Some of you are prayer warriors. Did you know that if you're a prayer warrior and you get up here and you try to preach, the devil's not impressed. He's not scared at all. You know what absolutely frightens him to the place where he turns white? Is when you close your prayer closet and you start praying heaven down. Come on now. We're going to have to return the gospel of the kingdom back within society. I will not allow them to lock it up in the four doors of any church. It's too big. It's too great. It's not even big enough for a nation to hold. It's not big enough for the earth to hold. And they're wanting us to, well, you have freedom of speech. No, freedom of speech is out there, not in here. It's my house. I say what I want to. But out there, I can still say what I want to because there's freedom of speech right now in this country. And we ought to rise up and slap anybody down that tries to stop our constitutional rights in this nation. Be they Democrat or Republican. Why? Because they gave an oath to protect and to support the Constitution of the United States. And the minute they go against it, we need to slap them down like an oath breaker they are. Well, Mike, you know, there are people that will get you on the, I, I am an alias terrorist by that position. What does that mean? I'm a terrorist and I don't know it. Yes, I'm here to terrorize the devil. I'm here to terrorize the communist. I'm here to show them the foolishness of their ways and that there's only one kingdom and the only way we're going to ever get to utopia is when Jesus comes and rules and reigns on planet earth. Oh, that was not in my notes. Let's go to Psalms chapter 62. I want to start here with verse 5. I feel an old anointing coming back, Mary. How long are you going to preach? About as long as it takes. I've been known to go two, three hours without a break. Because we got some good stuff to handle this morning. You notice there's no timer anymore in this studio. I about drop kicked it. But I thought, well, I paid good money for that. I'll put it up. Maybe somebody else can use it. I won't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, glory to God. Have you found Psalm 62, verse 5? My soul waits silent for the Lord alone, for my expectation is from Him. Underline that in your Bible. My expectation, some translations translate hope. That same Hebrew word can be translated expectation or hope. They're synonymous. He is my rock, my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Now notice there's not in parentheses unless the Luciferian elite do something else. How many know that's not there? Then say, it happens unless the devil's up to something. How many know the devil is always up to something? But the kingdom principle is we're to be wrestling until we get him under our feet and then keep him there. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my salvation and my refuge is of God. Trust in him at all times. How many times? All times. Pour out your heart before him. That's a call to prayer. God is a refuge for us. Silana, that Hebraically, what that means is stop and think about it. Stop and meditate on that. It's like when you get a real good piece of steak. How many know you don't want to woof that thing down? You sit there and you want to chew on it and chew on it because the longer you chew on it, the better flavor you get. And especially you get it with just the right proportion of A1 sauce and all that on or You just want that steak. 
I mean, I've had some that you don't even need a knife. You just cut it with a fork. And it's like, man, I should have ordered a 16 ounce because ah, this stuff is so good. That's what Selah means. To sit there and chew on the word, meditate on it. The first thing he said, I'm going to do, he said, I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait on him. What does that mean? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. And I'm not just, you know, I, I, I'm tired of people just doing little sound bites. Sometimes I have a hard time not wanting to read the entire chapter so I can set it in context. I had one guy in one of my older videos this week, I got a notice from YouTube, he's, he said, boy, this guy's really reading a lot into this scripture. And by the time I got the notice, somebody had already answered yes, context, history, culture, geography, and grammar. <laughs> okay. I thought that was funny. I don't even have to defend myself anymore. There's already a remnant out there saying, yeah, we've been sitting underneath this long enough. We know that you have to add the history to it. You have to add the culture to it. And so I want to start in verse 25 here. To whom then shall you liken me? Or to whom shall be my equal? This is God talking. Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see he who has created these things, who brings out their hosts by number. He calls them all by name. And by greatness of his might and the strength of his power, no one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. Now why was God speaking these things? He just didn't speak it in a vacuum. That's why you need to go. There were certain things that were going on when Isaiah spoke. There were certain things that was going on when Jeremiah spoke. I'm going to get off topic for a minute because this is something Mary and I were talking about last night. Jeremiah got no respect from the people of Israel. He was trying to tell them trouble's coming, repent, get right with God. And he was a weeping prophet because he was weeping because they wouldn't listen. And so they locked him up in prison. This is the way to shut you up. You know, when Nebuchadnezzar raised the Jerusalem, he gave orders, go find that prophet in prison, and you set him free, and, after you, and he is to stay in the land, and he can do whatever he wants. When the people of God would not honor a true prophet, Nebuchadnezzar did. Jeremiah did get his honor. Here Isaiah is speaking because the king sent him because there was an army amassing. Sennacherib was amassing. The Assyrian army. In fact, the Assyrian army, they waged war based on terror. In fact, they were the archetypes of terrorism historically. They invented terrorism. That they had this massive army and they had a war engine that was like none other. And when they went through, they, like, they, they raped, pillaged, burned. That they would literally have put heads on pikes that became literally like forests. They wanted to strike such terror that whenever they came to a new nation, that nation would bow down. And say, who can stand against you? Sennacherib was sending threat letters threatening, here we come. There's not a thing you can do to stop us. Here we come. There has been no God been able to stop us. Who's your God? And the king of Israel would take those letters and he would lay them out in the temple. And he would say, behold what they say. It's like the Luciferian elite today. We've got this plan. Who can stop us? We control everything. Who can stop us? We control terrorism. Who can stop us? I know somebody that can stop you. You see what terrorism has not seen 
probably since the days of, of Sennacherib, God sent down one warring angel. You think that they will, you know, when you look at what DARPA's wanting to do, they're wanting to build supernatural, superhuman killing machines. You could have a field of terminators, and one warring angel would decimate them within minutes. And in one night, 180,000 soldiers dead because God sent one angel. Oh, no, you. Have you read the book of Revelation? How many know Mystery Babylon is one big, hung, huge thing? By the time we get to that place in Babylon, it literally becomes a super city nation that the earth is under one governor, one king, and it becomes a super city of Cain. So God says, how am I going to take this thing down? I better go get 10,000 angels, 100,000 angels, a million angels. He sends down one angel. One angel that has this little scroll that says, your comeuppance have come. <laughs> you see, I don't need four angels. I don't need ten angels. I don't need 42 angels. Hell trembles when heaven sends one into the first heaven. Now, second heaven, there's war going all the time. But when one steps over into the first heaven, all the second heaven pauses and says the board is getting ready to get rearranged. <laughs> and we serve the captain of the host. We serve the captain of the army. Shh. All he needs to do is send one angel and D.C. would be transformed overnight. Come on. Hmm. Hoorah! Okay. That's why he says, listen, this guy and this massive army, they had war eagles, they had all these different things that they had going on, and they showed absolutely no mercy. And so you want to talk about people crying out to God. And they're... Saying, you know, we're crying out, we're not getting anything. He said, you know what, listen, let me, let me tell you something. Now, unless, you, unless you, you haven't gotten this, have you not known, have you not heard? The creator of the ends of the earth neither faints nor is weary. Here's the battle. Here's the full length of time. Here's the battle. And the only time God ever sweat was in Gethsemane. Because in Gethsemane, he began to carry the iniquity load of every human being ever born. That was the only time all the billions that have ever or will ever exist before the Lord comes back and we shut this thing down fell on one human body at one time. And it's the only time that God ever sweat. And he sweat drops of blood as that struggle began to cause the capillaries to burst in his, on his forehead. But you don't read in the book of Revelation, you don't read in the prophets that in the conflict to come that Jesus ever sheds one drop of sweat. There is no fear. You don't find him when he rides and he takes care in the valley of Armageddon and decimates the army of the Antichrist. You do not see him getting off the horse out of breath. You do not see him having to wipe the sweat off of his brow. This whole war, before man was ever created, never wearied God. 
Selah. You see this big thing coming, don't you know? Hadn't the prophet ever told you? God doesn't get tired. God didn't get tired on the seventh day in the book of Genesis. After six days of creation, he rested so that we would have a pattern to follow and a day to honor him because a man without God will work himself to death. God says, that day you don't work, you remember me, that way you can get recharged. How many feel like you've been recharged today just a little bit? I'm starting to see some of that green light coming back, okay. I got a little bit today. You know what? You start doing this in your prayer closet, you can get a little bit every day. Oh. Verse 29 is for you. He gives power to the weak, and those who have no might, he increases strength. Can you imagine these people seeing this army amass around Jerusalem? You want to talk about weak knees, trembling hands, ducking at every shadow. God says, you know what? I'm going to change this in you. I'm going to change this in you. I'm going to give strength to those who don't have any. You say, God, I don't have any. You're a perfect candidate for this scripture. Or Lord, I only have this much and I need this much. You're a perfect candidate. Unless your strength is just running over and your courage is just running over because there's not enough room to contain it, you're a candidate for this scripture. Well, how do I get it? He says, now listen, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And you know what's interesting? This Hebrew word has a sister word, mikvah, to baptize. It's mikrah. Have you ever seen the zitzi, the, the tachalet on the zitzi? You have the blue cord that goes through and it's, so it's interwoven into every knot and, uh, and, and everything within, within the, the, uh, on the prayer shawl. Because the only way you can walk the commandments or even walk in the name of God is the Messiah has to be interlaced in all of that. And actually it's, it's he who has entwined himself with the Lord. He has taken the time to get lost in Jesus. And he is so lost in Jesus that no matter where the devil tries to grab you, he gets a hold of some Jesus. That's what this is talking about here. You see, because where Jesus is, there is strength. Well, Mike, I don't have any strength. You just answered your own question that was coming up next. You've got to bring Jesus there. Now, you do not praise God for all things, but you praise God in all things. I don't care why, how my body feels right now, but I praise you that you are my healer. I don't care about the financial situation that I'm in right now. I know that, it's, that nine times out of ten or 99 times out of a hundred, it was my stupidity that got me there. But I, I tell you what, you're still the father that owns all the hills and all the tater and the gold underneath. And I serve you. That there's not a situation that you can't change. And as I intertwine myself with you, I'm going to change my woolly ways. Come on now. You can't just add Jesus to it and think you can keep doing the same thing and get different results. That's why we have the Word. You do what the Word says, and when you do what the Word says instead of what the world told you to do, you get kingdom results, and Jesus starts being intertwined into your life. Mm. You see, that's one of the reasons I don't eat pork. How many know pork and you know, shrimp? Man, Long John Silver's eight wasn't enough. I used to get 16. I used to think the guy that invented the spiral ham, you put that in a potato doodah together, and I mean, you're, you're, I, I, I just thought that was just set down from heaven itself, special spiral ham. That guy needed to get a Nobel Prize for inventing the spiral ham. Why don't I eat it? My king said not to. I'll give it up because he's greater. I'm not going to argue with him. 
I'm not going to try to have a theological argument to where I can go ahead and get to heaven. And You can go to heaven and eat ham all day long. It may send you to heaven earlier. And, it, and you're, not, you're not even having the lesson because they say, well, that's part of, of ritual cleanness. Yes, he was trying to tell you this is clean, this is not. The same way that you, you tell your kids if they're toddlers, if you have an inside animal, don't eat out of the dog bowl. Okay. God's forbidden list is, he's saying, kids, that's yucky. Don't eat my garbage disposals. Eat the stuff I made for food. Why? Because I want to be the God who heals you. I don't want to put in the diseases that are on the Egyptians on you. And I tell you what, they ate every nasty thing that you could ever imagine. How did I get off of that? Oh yeah, just because I love God and I'm intertwining with him. I knew there was a way to get back to where I needed to be. Now, as I am intertwining myself in God and renewing my strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. Now, we think that eagle thing, and we think, oh, we're just going to soar, and we so take it, not realizing that they were looking at harpy eagles are bigger, that were trained killers in the army, and they were fighting war eagles. Them things have a wingspan of about six feet. It was a harpy eagle. There, there's some commentators, when I have read this research, they got them out of the Himalayans, and there may be an, an extinct eagle that was actually larger. Well, what can an eagle do? Well, if you have a strap and they're dangling these big lead balls and they come swooping down and that lead ball hits you in the forehead and they're going about 70 miles an hour, how many know that the last thing that people are going to hear around you is splat? It was the original flying Claymore mine. And if that didn't get you, how many know them talons would? And God says, you're, you're fearing that, and I'm going to loose an anointing in you to take you above that which you fear. Oh, I can't shout as big as I just felt on the inside. I wouldn't have the voice left to preach. And they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Guys. It was under the greatest threat that Isaiah gave some of the greatest prophetic words of victory. Let's look at another one because he spoke this at the same time period. Isaiah 54, 13 through 17. God promises them, and all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. So how do you get established in life? You get established in the righteousness of Jesus. Well, how do I get established in the righteousness of Jesus? When there's so much Jesus in you that you're acting like Jesus all the time. And his righteousness begins to bleed through. You get established in that walk. You shall not fear. You shall be far from oppression and you shall not fear. And from terror, it shall not come near you. Now, when Isaiah prophesied this, they could literally look out their doors and see terror filling the horizon. And you're thinking, terror is not going to come near me? And it's a half mile away? Still not in your face yet. We can see what the Luciferian leader wanting to do. They got nanotech. They got chemtrails. They, they have poisoned the air, poisoned the water, poisoned the food, poisoned the vaccines, poisoned the medicine. Do you know what? God's greater. I like what Randy said. He said, here's how, I, here's how I bless my food. God, they have poisoned the air, poisoned the water, and poisoned everything I put into my mouth. But the moment it goes in my mouth, it's got to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. 
The Holy Ghost and fire is keeping me alive. Your fire on the inside has got to be greater than the poison on the outside. Oh, that wasn't in my notes either. <clears throat> it said, now indeed they shall a surly symbol. But it goes on, but not because of me. God did not bring in Sennacherib and his army to teach the body anything, to teach Israel anything. What does that tell me? The Luciferian lead have their plan. Now how many know that, you know, I've, I've got good friends that are watching what they want to do, and they keep on saying, this year, this year is it, this year is it. Why? Because the Luciferian, is, it's not that they're prophesying anything, because they're not prophesying. What they're saying is, here is what they want to do, and they're trying to implement it this year. Well, you see, they tried in 2012, they tried in 2013, they tried in 2014, they tried in 2015. What is stopping them from getting it done? Because God said it, it's not of me. And they're not going to get it done. See, that's been my prayer. God, I want you, before this thing is over, this last great revival comes, I want you to knock them on their face, and I want your foot across the back of their neck and say just one more time before I let you have this ball that I'm going to absolutely show you that I am King of King and Lord of Lords. And even though you're trying to plan on circumventing prophecy, you're going to do it the way I said it, and you're going to do it when I said it. Because I am letting you to fulfill my plan that's beyond searching. Even the devil doesn't have a clue. Ugh. That's who we serve. Our problem is our vision of Jesus is not big enough. It's not great enough. You need to read the book of Revelation to get a true image of who Jesus is now. You see, he, was, he came as Messiah ben Joseph. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. How many know that there was a transition in the spirit after he rose from the dead? He's now Messiah ben David waiting to be loosed by the Father to come and settle the score. The apostle John, the one who Jesus even entrusted the care of his mama as he was dying on the cross. How many know that you got to be real personable with somebody like that? There was, there was a true, John was the inter, you know, there's the, there's the 12 and there's the three. There, dude, there was the one. His name was John. That during the Last Supper, the Apostle John leaned his head and rested it on the chest of Jesus and heard the heartbeat of of God. And when John, while he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, saw Jesus as he is now, and then I tell you what, when you get to heaven, buddy, there is no dimmer switch on Jesus. He had the dimmer switch turned down to point zero 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 one except for one time, and it was on the Mount of Hermon that he was transfigured, and he turned it up to two. But how many know when you get to heaven, it's a ten? John, this one who was intimate with the Savior, who had prayed every day and was faithful in doing what he was told to do by Messiah and faithful to be led by the Spirit of God, when he saw Jesus as he is now, he, a born-again, Spirit-filled believer, hit the dirt as a dead man. That's who you're serving now. That's Jesus with the veil torn. And you're seeing into the Holy of Holies. That's the Jesus that saved your soul. That's the Jesus that is warring for you right now. That's the Jesus that is sending a refreshing to you right now. That is a Jesus who is going to have his way in planet earth. Even as darkness rises in the last days. That he, there is going to be a tsunami of the power of God to get that last one harvest. Before he comes back. 
Now listen, verse 16. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings an instrument for his work, and I have created the creator, I have created the destroy the spoiler to destroy. Now on one side we can take that God basically said, I created Sennacherib, when I'm ready, I can take him out. On the flip side, he said, Listen, I created Lucifer. And he has his day of reckoning coming. And he is limited in what he can do. Oh, but Mike, you don't understand. There's watcher technology. No, 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 tech. They're moving in occult power. They did all that in the day of Noah. Noah didn't bow the knee. He didn't have the blood of Jesus or the name of Jesus, and he didn't bow the knee. And then God told him, I want you to go build a boat out in the middle of nowhere and start preaching that something's going to happen that you have never seen before. Rain. I am absolutely blessed by Noah. You want me to build a boat? You know, the, the big luxury liners. You know, they can only build boats so big, but they, they needed to build them larger. And they couldn't figure out how. They would try and they would say, how many know that's not good for a boat? And so one Christian who was a boat builder went back and studied Noah's ark, which was far bigger than anything they could build, and when he followed God's basic design, that bad boy floated. And all of the huge artilleries, you know, the, uh, the uh, not, not artillery, artilla of ships that we have that are almost like floating cities, all go back to the same designed concepts that that guy drew from the Bible out of Noah's ark. Didn't know that little bit of history, did you? God knows what he's talking about. And steel is a whole lot better than wood. Then you don't have to pitch it within and without with tar. But the same premise, the same concept, the same template was there. God is so far ahead. If John G. Lake when they were ministering in Africa, and this has been documented by scientists. It's not just, he was not evangelistically speaking. When you have 10 people at the meeting and two get saved, you go around telling 200 people got saved, that's evangelistically speaking, you know. This was documented that there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague in Africa. And so his healing teams, I mean, he had such an effect on Africa during World War I. They had regular medical teams for guys to get shot up and stuff. And he had healing teams. And more guys lived in the healing tents than they did from the medical tents. Documented. There were scientists fighting the bubonic plague and they would, they would take all the shots and, and try to wear what they would consider hazmat suits and we'd call them ridiculous today compared to what we have. They were getting sick, his people weren't. They just made sure they got their Holy Ghost shot before they went out. And John says, let's do an experiment. I want you to take a slide and I, and I want you to put, because people would die with a, with a frothy, like slobber, and it was teeming because it would come out of their lungs. It was teeming with bubonic plague. He said, put that on a slide. And they look, yeah, boy, that's bad. He said, let me have it. He put it in his hand. He just began to worship God. And after a while, he'd say, okay, that's, that should be enough. Put it back under the slide. Every germ was dead. You know what that means? Nanotech in the presence of God in you has got to deactivate. You know, I kind of think Mary kind of has that anointing on her now because a lot of technology she gets around it, it just kind of wants to shut down. 
And I think it's because she prays so much that there's, always, there's already this, this kind of bleed over. Can you imagine believers walking onto the field of battle and all the electronics shut down? Why can't we surveil this one guy? He doesn't show up in videos. Because God had, he's on a mission. And the king said, his mission ain't none of your business. They think that they, you know, Steve Quayle talks about that they have these airships. Uh, I forgot what the model number is, that they can actually open up a dimensional portal and appear on the other side of the planet. Oh, Mike, that's amazing. Oh, man, we've had that for 2,000 years. Haven't you read the book of Acts? Philip, need him here? Oh, I need him over here. He's there. He's done. It. He's gone. I remember reading a story about a man, and he was an oiler down in Texas. And he was praying and fasting and seeking God. God, I just want to be used of you. I just want to be used of you. And he stepped off an oil rig, and when his foot hit the ground, he was in the jungles of Africa. And there was a young boy there crying because he wanted to know Jesus. And so he led him to the Lord. And as he turned to walk away, his next step was off that oil rig. And he thought, man, I just had some bad pizza. And so he said, but there was a unique mud on his boots. And he went and had it tested, and it was only indigenous to parts of Africa. And so years later, he goes to Africa, and there's this young black preacher that I mean is tearing a path through Africa. And when he sees this guy, he runs to him, and he falls on his knees. And he said, I have prayed for years to be able to meet you face to face. He said, you vanished like an angel. He said, all these years, I didn't know if you were a man or an angel, but you led me to Jesus as I was crying out in despair. Don't tell me we have to fear about them opening up portals. You see, if God wants you somewhere, you're going to be where he wants you, when he wants you, and Space and time does not matter. We have a God that fills every moment of every time. And he can pluck you out of the first heaven and plop you down wherever he wants you. And you don't have to have a passport. You don't have to go through immigration. You're just there and you're gone before the enemy even knows you're there. <laughs> you see, I'm waiting for one of these times that there's going to be a prophet of God praying and, there, and, and there's men gathered around the president and they're trying to convince him to go to war. And then out of nowhere pops into his bunker a prophet that begins prophesying to him what God is going to do. And when they reach out to grab him to imprison him, he's going to be gone. Those are the things, end time things, that's going to get the attention of the elite. And that's what's absolutely scaring the snot out of them. You see, in the New Testament, the church, church thrived under intense persecution. Not only were the Romans wanting to wipe them out, but so were the Jews. That's really rough for a Gentile who found Messiah. And you have all these rabbis saying, you're not being Jewish enough, and you're having all your family saying, why are you a Jewish wannabe? I bet they were relieved in Antioch when they started mocking them and saying, you're just being like little Christos running around. Thank you, I will be called a Christian. Because I follow Messiah and Messiah alone. I don't follow any other rabbi but Rabbi Jesus. Oh. I got crying here and I can't even see my notes. So in the midst of that, he said, no weapon formed against you would prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you shall, come, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the saints of the Lord. Are you a saint of the Lord? Then your heritage is, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every witchcraft spell, every incantation, no matter what they do, it's your heritage to condemn it. Oh my. I can't 
can't see my notes. I'm becoming a weeping preacher. We need to understand when we look at the case of Sennacherib and what's going on, we need to be able to separate within our hearts the judgment of God and the work of the enemy. They don't necessarily need to be synonymous. In the days ahead, listen to this, the Luciferian elite are not the instruments of God's judgment. They're not like a Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, in the end times, God's judgment is supposed to be falling on the Luciferian elite. They aren't the judgment. They're going to be getting the judgment. God created the men that chose to rebel and align themselves with Lucifer. They are answerable to him and he can handle them. There should have been a real good amen right there. Waiting on the Lord represents taking the time in prayer so that Messiah is intertwined in every part of our life and character. And for those who wait on the Lord, for those who wait on the Lord, no weapon formed against them will prosper. Hmm. So I want to ask you, what weapon has the enemy forged against you today? Well, Mike, it's mind control. That ain't a thing compared to God. He's the only one I know of that can unscramble an egg. <laughs> You don't understand, they, they use the C word. Time to use the J word over the C word. You don't understand, but I'm old. You 120 yet? Moses didn't even start ministry until he was 80. And I thought, oh man. <laughs> so much for semi-retirement. Our fellowship with God in His Word, expectation begins to build within our spirits. If this is not happening, what you feeding on? I love Steve, and I love a lot of guys out there, and I'll tell you what, I get a lot of kingdom intelligence from Steve, and I'm grateful for him and Doug Hagman and all these guys. And I'm not talking them down, and there's a, there's a plethora of YouTube channels all these guys that you could, you could eat a diet of Nephilim, UFOs, giants, and end time stuff 24-7 and still not even, even touch the buffet bar, if you will. That needs to be 20% of what you're feeding yourself on. You need to understand what the enemy is doing, but you better have 80% in the Word and with God. Because when you do, you find out just how small that 20% is. Well, Mike, I may have to face a Nephilim. Got a rock? I tell you what, I'm still waiting. Randy and I still need to work on that cue round. Take out Nephilim, make watchers want to run. You see, it's what's in your hand. That's referring back to last year's true legend. Anything the anointing is on. And God puts the anointing on what is in your hands. Moses had a stick. He said, go down and take down the mightiest nation on the planet with a stick. <laughs> How many know when he waved that stick, stuff happened? In fact, at the end, as they're, they're facing the Red Sea, and Moses begins to pray, God says, shut up, raise the stick. <laughs> Haven't you got this yet? Whoosh. Cool. It's what's in your hands. Mike, all I got is a praise. <laughs> That'll drive the enemy crazy. I remember listening to a preacher years ago, and Satan had tried to kill him several times, and he said, literally said it was like, he said, I was fighting this sickness. And he said, it was like the devil came to me and said, I'm going to kill you, and it's going to be gruesome, and you're not going to finish what God told you to do. And he said, I, he said, you know, at first fear began to strike, and he said, all of a sudden out of his spirit, this laughter began to, he said, I started laughing in the face of the devil. And he said, you know, when you're laughing in somebody's face after a while, he said, they'll say, why are you laughing? 
And he said, what came out of my mouth is you think you can take me up before he said, I'm going. I'm not done yet. And if this is an obstacle, it's going down. Hmm. Our expectations give way to kingdom empowerment. When biblical expectation begins to explode in your heart, God is your rock, your salvation, your defense, your strength, your refuge, and your glory. But we have gotten into a place that we are not expecting anymore. Are you guys tired here? Do you want me to go on? Everybody? All right. Yes, you heard this at home. All right. The final word about expectation, let's look at Proverbs 24, 13 and 14. Remember when you see hope, expectation, they're the same Hebrew word. They may just be translated differently. My son, eat honey because it's good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to your taste. Now I think that's talking about the Word of God. Meditate on the Word, not what the enemy's doing. Meditate on your victory, not on your giant. David has spent so much time in the field meditating on God when he ran across Goliath. His first response was, why are you guys hiding from this puny little giant? This uncircumcised Philistine. And see, I think if he would have missed with all five rocks, he had a staff and he'd have beat that guy to death with his shepherd's staff. One way or another, that giant was going down. When you meditate on the word, faith is supposed to rise. That's one of the reasons right now I'm teaching on, on, de on developing faith that can be deployed. Functional faith. Not theoretical faith. Theoretical faith that isn't going to do you anything. It's got to function in your day-to-day -day life. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you have found it, there is prospect. And that's what it says in the New King James. In the King James and many other translations, this is your reward. That when the knowledge of wisdom gets into your soul, it's a reward. Why? And your hope will not be cut off. When God's wisdom becomes prominent in your soul, the reward of you taking the time to dine on the honey of God is God promises you that your expectation shall not be cut off. Hmm. I got one last point that has five or six sub points. Is that okay? Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. It's time to prepare the way of the Lord. The same pattern that we saw with Messiah's first coming, we will have a similar pattern at his second coming. How many know John the Baptist was not the reincarnation of Elijah? He came in the anointing of Elijah. In the days in 2020 and beyond, there are many John the Baptist that are waiting out in the desert place that nobody has heard of. They are remnant, they are apostles, they are prophets, they are evangelists and pastors and teachers, and they will not be like the religious leaders that feed people watered down milk and feed them soppy toast, and they call it church, that they are going to deliver a true word of God, that when they prophesy, nations are going to tremble. That's where we're headed. Isaiah 40, 35, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight in the crooked place and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now one of the complexities of Hebraic prophecy is you can have compound prophecies in the same sentence. You see, when John the Baptist came on the scene, 
the writers of all the Gospels said it was fulfilling part or verse 3. And when the Lord comes back, we get the rest of it. We are closer to the crooked places being made straight, the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed in all flesh. There's not going to be any secret return of Jesus when he comes back. There's going to be all flesh will see the glory. And the Bible says at the brightness of his coming, all the bad guys go... He just showed up with the dimmer turned all the way up to 10. And the greatest armada, the greatest army ever amassed in human history that is so technologically advanced. I mean, I, I think they probably have everything from dinosaurs to Nephilim and everything in between. There's even evidence with what they're doing with CERN that these spacelets, every time they do one of the collisions... It's a pre-Higgs boson particle that we have nothing to contain it and it just gravitates down to the center of the earth in our earthen core. And scientists are worried to get enough of those in there that it will turn, the, it'll turn our planet into a brown dwarf star. How many know stars are a hard thing to live on? And there are those that believe that they're trying to make the earth itself a particle weapon to blast Jesus out of the sky. And so they, they're actually creating a way to turn the earth into a weapon. And he's going to come back and say, you can't trip that trigger. That's my trigger. That's my earth. Go get your own dirt. And you're going to try to hit me with a particle blast. Let me just hit you with my glory. And the Bible says that there will, in, that, in that valley, blood will run as, as high as a horse's belly. And that for years... Almighty oh, God comes and says, hey, vultures, come on, I'll prepare a banquet for you of the corpses of my enemy. Come dine on Nephilim and super soldier and watcher. Because in, uh, in the Valley of Armageddon, Psalms 82 is fulfilled. They're going to die like men. Oh, I didn't want to get into that, but I'm going to. The expectation of the kingdom and the ability to, you see, when, when these teachers begin to move and they begin to, and the apostles and prophets and those that have waited on the Lord, they're going to be Holy Spirit filled and the expectation of the kingdom and the ability to move in kingdom power is going to be released across the body of Christ from the greatest to the least. They're going to have a mandate to speak only the words that God has given them to speak. They're going to have an anointing to win souls. They're going to have an anointing to disciple nations. And the kingdom assignment given to them, that there is an anointing within that assignment that will withstand any weapon formed against them and to see God's will done on earth in spite of mystery Babylon. Come on, no weapon formed against them will prosper. Now the word, and, and you shall condemn, that Hebrew word there in Isaiah 54, 17 is rasha, which means you declare it as wicked. Wickedness is always marked for destruction. And you condemn it as guilty. You see, I think there's going to be some Ananias and Sapphiras that think that they can move by a Jezebel spirit or what other spirit, and they're going to start talking down the things of God. They're going to start coming against the things of God. And you're going to see a sweeping of God's hand, and you're going to look for them, and they're not going to be found anymore. You see, what God's going to do, God's going to do, and no one's going to stop it. Guys, it's time to see the power of Messiah bring down all these, th all these giants in your life. It is time to see a renewal of your strength. It is time to have a fresh vision and purpose released into your life. It is time for you to raise up an expectation to the see the kingdom moving in you with end time power to overcome any giant. That's our task for 2020. You need to name your giants. 
I mean literally get down a pad and paper and you write down the giants or the bondages or whatever the enemy has put in your life that's holding you back and then go into the word and find God's promise to overcome them and daily, daily hit that thing, daily quote the word over that thing, daily call for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to absolutely eradicate that thing out of your body, out of your mind, out of your soul, out of your life. At the end of 2020, we're going to be healthier than we have ever been. We're going to be stronger than we have ever been. We're going to be moving in the power of God. And he's going to, because every step of the way, you enter into things like that, God is going to start showing you the places that you need to adjust. Because his righteousness is going to be established in you. Never expect the God to change the enemy until he first changes you. If the enemy's in the house, who opened the door? You got to run him out. God's got to show you how he got in, and you need to close that door and lock it and replace it with righteousness. 2020 is going to be a year of changing. We got a lot of changing to do. We got a lot of things coming with the new building, and I'm just, just a lot of things are rearranging. I'm getting to the place where I'm starting to hire a lot of other people to do stuff I don't even have have time to do in the ministry, like redoing our shopping cart and redoing our websites. I'm tired of looking our websites looking like Mickey Mouse did it. Come on, you you look at the old BLA site. That's done a web expression. Web expression was taken off the market eight years ago. I don't have time to learn the new stuff. I don't have time to mess with the new stuff. I'm going to find spirit-filled men of God that do. And I'm going to let them do it. And then we can maintain it. I want a spirit of excellence in every one of our lives. Why is that important? How do you function in Babylon and not become a part of it? The Bible says Daniel had a spirit of excellence. Change is coming to you. Look in the mirror in the morning and say, you're going to be better tomorrow than you are today because Jesus is Lord. The words of your prayer are going to hold weight more tomorrow than they even did today. And when you get to the end of 2020, I want God to commission some Marines in the kingdom. That when you pray... The devil runs. That when you open your mouth, wisdom comes out. The anointing of God is there. Instead of you waking up in the morning saying, Oh Lord, it's morning and I hurt here. You get up in the morning, your feet hit the ground, you stand up and say, Glory to God. And the devil goes, Oh no, they're up. Man, we're going to get a beating again today. How many know that's possible? Oh, that's not possible. Well, God, all things are possible. And who are you serving? The one who created the ends of the earth? The creator of heaven and earth? Let me tell you something. A little dab of God will do you. God had an angel come down and give Elijah a bite of food, and he outran horses. I mean, no, that is kind of a tough deal to do. God didn't ask him what age he was or if arthritis was in his knees. When he ate that, he's gone. The only way the world can get that is they've got to do a comic and call it the Flash. No, there was Elijah before the Flash. You have yet, and I'm going to end with this, You have yet to even grasp within your mind who you can be when Jesus fully rules and reigns. And I can't wait to see what it's going to look like when you're there. I cannot wait. And this is the year to see it done in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we thank you for the word. 
Father, we ask that your word would accomplish what you have given today, Father, that expectation of Messiah ruling and reigning in us would come by your power, by your grace. Father, let us be a changed people at the end of this year. Father, no sickness, no disease, no bondage, but the fire of God in its place. Father, we decree and we declare this thing in Jesus' name. And Father, it's not something we bring to pass, it's something you're bringing to pass. And Father, we ask that every day you will cause us to will and to do your good pleasure. Is our Holy Ghost task for each and every day. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gathered to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the son of perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com that's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com that's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.